capes, and conundrums. So why do you use the term sniper to refer to someone using a very long-range weapon? Silicon asks Pavel at the third location. There's a bird on Earth. Really small, really alert and very well hidden. A swamp dweller called a snipe. Only the best marksmen could actually shoot it. And you needed more than accuracy. You needed patience, stealth, and uncanny good powers of observation to find it before it finds you and flees. It's so good at hiding that a snipe hunt is slang for sending a sucker on a fool's errand to keep them chasing things that don't exist. Pavel explains as he lines up the next shot. All right, this one is a bit of an assist, so I can't take full credit. He squeezes the trigger gently, and the weapon kicks back without a sound. The bullet rips through the air and careens into a meticulously placed air car's side and ricochets inside the body to compromise its rear boosters and send it crashing into the ground backwards to kill another three people. Even with the help you had with that, that's an insane level of accuracy, the Sonir who followed them states. No one ever accused humans of being sane. Pavel states as he picks up the gun and puts down its struts before slinging it behind his back. Now don't forget to drop the wrapper, they still need big clues. It's weird that on the hardest setting that you're still going easy on us. The Sonir states, and Pavel chuckles. The amount of damage that a well-funded, well-trained and well-motivated military operative can do is nothing short of terrifying. Give them enough prep time, and there will be witnesses that he was not only unconnected, but outright off the list of suspects for trying to help out. Really? She asks. Oh yes, I may be a good sniper, but if I wanted someone dead, I'd get someone in demolitions to help me out. Plant a bomb, put it on a perfect timer, and then position myself to be partially caught in the blast. Make sure I take a touch of shrapnel so I'm good and bloody for the cameras and be right there on ground zero to help people out while also being able to finish the job if the bomb wasn't enough. This way I dodge all suspicion, make sure the target is dead, and am in the perfect position to enact contingencies if it wasn't enough. Did I really piss you off that badly? Silicon asks, and Pavel chuckles. You'd have to try a lot harder than a simple brawl to get me murderous. Then why do you have a plan that involves what must be potential knife work as a backup solution? Not to mention, it has you being deliberately harmed to allay suspicion. You don't strike me as an assassin kind of person. The Sonier asks as she flutters to pursue both men off the rooftop and follow them down. I'm not. But we weren't sure how much or how little such a thing was needed when we were traveling through cruel space. Long story short, we had no idea what to expect beyond the language and a general idea of technology. We didn't know if we were entering an eternal paradise, an unending hell, or anything in between. A lot of people, myself included, thought that there was good odds that there would at least be one species we could pass for. Meaning that even if the Dauntless was broken and we were scattered, we would be able to disappear with a bit of caution. So we started putting plans together to wage one-man wars against anything we had to fight. Oh. So does that mean your personal journal has detailed plans to topple governments? Silicon asks, and Pavel snorts in amusement. You think I'm dumb enough to have it down in writing? Oh no, you'll need a way to rip it out of my mind if you want to see them. Pavel tells them both as he leads them down the stairwell. But enough about me. Miss Sunir, you've been following us like a lost kitten for about 25 minutes now, and you've yet to even give us your name. What? Well, you've already overheard me and Silicon talking, so you know what his name is, and you know I'm called Pavel. But what about yourself? I'm called Duty, she says, and Pavel pauses for a moment. You know I can't really figure out Sonir naming conventions. I hear things like Shadow Flight, Echo Song, or Deep Wing, or whatever. And then there's simple one-word names like mercy, duty, or cruelty. What's going on? There are a lot of Sonir and a lot of Sonir naming conventions. There are at least five major ones on Skathak alone. Really? 
Some of us are named for what the parent hopes us to have. Some go poetic. Others borrow the traditions of other species. There's the standard untranslated name or idea plus a family name. Finally, there's the one where you collect more names as you go. And that's just on Skathak. Wait, wouldn't the parent hope one just come out normal if you use another language? We don't have a language of our own. We have to borrow other ones. Duty replies in frustration. Oh. Right, sorry. Pavel mutters. It's a strange problem to have. Humanity is inundated with so many languages that there are dozens that are outright dying at any given moment. Not to mention regional accents so thick they count as entirely different languages. Get an Irishman, a Scotsman, and an Englishman all in the same room, and they'll all speak perfect English and understand nothing from the other men. Yes, well... Why not start with your hearing range? Silicon asks. I beg your pardon? Duty asks. If you don't have a language, the logical thing to do is make a new one. So if you're going to do that, then I suggest starting at your higher hearing ranges than the galactic norm. It will let you make it much more distinctly yours. The more people outright can't speak it, the easier you can stamp it as yours. Silicon states and Pavel glances back at him before snorting. They're at the bottom of the stairwell at this point. You need to get into contact with Santiago, the guy who plays Bane the most. He's been brainstorming ways to help the Sonier culturally. Duty frowns at that as a deep sense of indignation and injury flows over her. She knows they mean well but she can't help but feel dismissed and disregarded by the very idea of someone handing over culture secondhand. She knows it's absurd, possibly even insane, to feel such a thing when she reasonably knows better. But it's still stinging and feels dirty. There's a sense of longing, failure, and downright injury over the idea of such a thing. She doesn't like the idea. No, she really doesn't like the idea of a language or culture being handed over. It rankles at her pride. No one had to build a city on Skathak, but the Sonir had done so anyways. But also no one asked them to remodel their city after a fictional setting that appealed to their sensibilities in a way that had been long unspoken. Duty had actually studied why the Gotham style had fit so well, and the conclusion was both simplistic and almost profound. It resembled the homeworld. Enormous caverns with gigantic stalagmites the homeworld had been odd in that large floating beasts would knock away growing stalactites, so things only came up from the ground. Apparently the sky beasts were the original hunting target on the planet, before the night beasts that the Sonir ancestors were responded to the hum of hunting equipment with extreme hostility. That began two centuries of bloodshed, followed by three of protection. Half a millennia and animals became people. People without a past beyond beasthood. You've been seething back there for a few minutes now, Silicon states. What has you so upset? Nothing. She grits out even as Pavel shows the way to the little hideaway. People don't seethe over nothing, Pavel says blandly, as he plucks out a sticker for children from a nearby try-and-fly family-owned restaurants. The whole place was designed to appeal to so near body types and tastes, and was very popular with children. He slips it loosely onto the side of his rifle and heads out again. No, but someone's opinions and thoughts aren't anyone else's business. Duty states. And to her surprise, Pavel just shrugs at that and treats it as if the conversation is simply over. Not that she was almost ready to bite. Is he dismissing her as a threat? Is she not... Both men turn and stare at her for a moment. Duty, are you sick or hurt? Your emotions are pouring into the axiom like crazy, Pavel states. She's angry, Pavel, Silicon says, and Pavel frowns before gesturing for Silicon to step to the side. He then puts the rifle to the side and crouches down a little to be face to face. Have I done something to offend Madam, or are you remembering unpleasant times? Pavel asks, and she huffs hard. I... It... Nothing you've done, but I feel like... I shouldn't. You need to talk? He asks. No, I need to deal. 
I'm getting angry that you're trying to help out on something that's beyond you and not your business and... She bites off the rant coming out and looking away. Just... Never mind. It's my emotions being stupid. Nothing to worry about. I'll deal with it. All right. If you say so. Pavel says before rising up and turning away. Duty takes a breath and then sighs. She makes up her mind about things. She's getting angry. It's irrational. And things aren't going to improve if she can't vent or find a way to get out of it. I'm going to take off now. I'm still getting angry. It's stupid. I'm being stupid. It happens. Thanks for letting me hang around. Duty says as they leave the mall to head to the next perch. She takes off hard and is gone in moments. She has problems. Silicon notes. Yeah, thankfully she's an adult and dealing with it like one too. Pavel says. Now come on, we lost some time and need to set off the next shot. More stairs, Joy. Easier leg day, no problem. Pavel replies, and Silicon rolls his eyes as they head into the next building and get climbing. The next shot is both the least and most impressive. The least amount of collateral damage, but the shot is even more insane than the other ones. Pavel bounces it twice. Direct hit, Silicon says as he checks the security feed off his communicator. I only felt a whisper of axiom. How did you... It only takes a whisper. A bit in the gun to silence it, and a special type of reinforcement in the bullet. Took me weeks to figure them both out, but it was worth it. Pavel explains as he gives his gun a brush and accidentally dislodges the sticker from the side of the gun. Time to go. How was my shot anyways? Side of the head. Instant kill on the dummy. Damn, I was going for the eye. Pavel mutters. Really? There's a little T-section in the face that has the eyes and general nose area. That's what I was going for. I think you're holding yourself to too high a standard. I'm better than the best of the best. I don't get to call myself that if I settle for anything less than beyond perfection. Every failure and mistake is another chance to grow stronger, wiser, and more capable. Mistakes happen. Repeating them is true. Failure. Pavel explains and Silicon is silenced by that comment. Swear to all gods that exist you have a list of those sayings somewhere. Silicon mutters and Pavel chuckles as he goes through his pockets and pulls out a bit of paper he holds out to Silicon as they head down the stairs. He unfolds it and scoffs in amusement. Second place is the first loser. Always go for first. It doesn't get easier. You just get stronger. Work it out. Train the pain. You can't finish what you haven't started. Limits exist to be broken. Your end is just the beginning of the next session. Pain is your excuses leaving the body. You goals are to be passed, not met. Pavel smirks as Silicon reads off the dozens of workout sayings and is only halfway done when they reach the bottom. You're crazy, human. You and your whole species, Silicon says, passing the slip of paper back. I hate to break it to you, but you're one of us now. I regret everything. Silicon states, and Pavel just lets out a low but evil-sounding cackle. You will, Silicon. You will. Could you make that sound any more ominous? Silicon asks, and Pavel nods before thumping his chest a couple times and clearing his throat a little. You will, Silicon. You will. He says in a voice that sounds like he gargles gravel and then coughs in discomfort as Silicon snorts hard.